plants. Uh, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes to allow other people to join. Uh, and meantime, I can uh, just send out an apology to, to everyone for some of the snafus we experienced in last week's uh, uh, seminar to do with um, Zoom bombers that we have uh, attended to the relevant issues and uh, we hope that won't reoccur. That was my pause to allow more people to, to join. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Victoria Nolan and Dr. Kathy Rogers to give uh, today's seminar. Uh, Victoria and Kathy are uh, long-term collaborators in the Center for Educational Neuroscience and both completed their PhDs at Bergbeck. Uh, they're gonna talk today about a really fascinating subject trying to take uh, principles of educational neuroscience and think about how they can be uh, applied in the field. This is a uh, a long project that started uh, a number of years ago when we were in contact with uh, UNESCO and the World Bank to begin thinking about how you could use neuroscience uh, to address or improve outcomes in um, adult literacy programs in uh, low-income countries. So I will hand over to uh, Kathy, there's going to be a tag team, Kathy and then Vic and then Kathy again. Uh, so welcome and I hand over to you, Kathy. Thanks very much, Michael. And thanks. Hello to everybody. And thanks very much for joining us today. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about uh, who we are. Um, so uh, Victoria is a lecturer in speech and language sciences at Newcastle University. And as Michael said, she's previously been involved with lots of different projects of the Centre for Educational Neuroscience, including the original neuro, neuro hit or neuro myths, um, which I know are being updated. And there's lots of lovely videos going out about those. Um, I'm Cathy and I recently completed a PhD in educational neuroscience and obviously can't resist the opportunity to give a quick plug to the book um, that Michael and I recently had published, which is an introduction to educational neuroscience. Discounts are available, we can email you the, the link. Um, and uh, before that, I was a science TV producer. So um, I was kind of translating science to mainstream audiences with science documentaries and shows like Scrappy Challenge and The Secret Life of Four-Year-Olds. Um, so today we're here to talk about an adult literacy project that we've had the privilege to be involved with. So first we wanted to give a bit of background about adult literacy globally. Um, so there are about 781 million non-literate adults in the world. Two thirds of them are women. And in certain parts of the world, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, half of all women can't read and write. Um, so in total, that's about three quarters of a billion people who can't read a simple sentence or write their own name. And for every person who's classified as illiterate, there are another four who have very low, um, very low levels of literacy. And even though um, improving adult literacy is a key United Nations sustainable development goal, the fact is that very little money is spent on it. It's typically about 1% of education budgets or a fraction of a percent of GDP. And um, as you can see from the map, low literacy rates are primarily a problem in the global south. The typical low literate adult is a woman who missed out on education as a child. Rural populations typically have lower literacy rates than urban populations, and it's primarily a problem for the poorest communities. So adults coming to literacy courses typically come with no recognition of letters or symbols. Why does any of this matter? I mean, there's a huge array of reasons. So kind of at a social level, there's higher literacy is associated with all kinds of beneficial outcomes economically, in terms of health, in terms of child and infant 
um, mortality improvements in terms of improved education for children. And there's also huge uh, importance at the level of the individual because higher literacy is associated with better subjective well-being. And in particular, from, from what we heard from the many women that we talked to in Malawi, which we'll be telling you about, um, overcoming the shame and stigma of not being able to sign your own name and instead having to use your thumbprint was a massive thing. And of all the things that we heard from women that we talked to who'd learned to read and write, probably the most common thing was the pride of no longer having to use my thumb. So how did this piece of work come about? It is a slightly long story, as Michael alluded to. So it started a few years ago with a report that, uh, that we wrote for the World Bank about the science of adult literacy. And the World Bank wanted to understand why the results of adult literacy programs, which they spend a lot of money on, um, were often disappointing in terms of effectiveness. And they wondered if the problem was that adult brains learn differently from children's brains, and they wanted us to tell them about the neuroscience of adult learning. So here we met kind of translation issues part one. Um, because the short answer to their question is yes, to some extent, adult brains do learn differently because there's differences in memory systems, in executive functions, in metacognition, in plasticity, in the level of the word, word knowledge that adults have compared to children. But we didn't think that was by any means the only or most important issue. We thought there were three other really important considerations. I mean, actually a lot more than three, but I'm going to summarize them as three. So the first is that um, literacy is not a binary, but a continuum. And the idea that a few months of even the best possible, most excellent literacy course is going to transform illiterate people into literate people is wrongheaded to, to begin with. Um, so a literacy course is more like the first steps of a many mile journey towards fluency. And the point of this slide, which Vic's going to go into a bit more detail on in, in a minute, is, is really just to show that actually what, a, what a, an adult literacy program that is starting with people with no literacy is doing is getting to the very first steps of this pyramid, which is a very, very long way from, from fluency. Um, the second related consideration is that learning to read and write is really, really hard. And I think as literate adults, we can tend to underestimate this. But if you imagine looking at something like this and imagine trying to achieve not just recognition, but fluency in recognizing and reproducing completely unfamiliar signs and shapes, you can begin to imagine the, the level of the, of the difficulty that is involved. And it takes children thousands of hours of practice to, to achieve fluency. Um, and the third consideration is that the constraints on adult literacy learning operate at many other levels than the brain. So things like motivation, the class environment, people's relationship with their peers, how much teachers are trained, gender attitudes, all sorts of cultural considerations like religion. The brain is just one of many, many factors. Um, so that in a nutshell was the World Bank report. And then the next stop in uh, what seems like a slightly circuitous journey to Malawi is with <laughs> the Finnish Bible Society. <laughs> um, so they fund adult literacy projects in East Africa. <clears throat> they read the World Bank report and they found it helpful in their thinking about their own programs. And they got in touch with us. Um, to, they're always trying to think about how to improve and evaluate their own programs. And they wanted to have an external eye on what they were doing. So that is where I'll hand over to Vic um, for now what is the, the meat of the talk, which is 
Malawi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, okay, so Cathy's talked a bit about global um, literacy, and I'm going to focus in on Malawi now. So uh, Malawi is um, an amazing country in southeastern Africa. Um, adult literacy rates here, according to UNESCO in 2015, are at about 62%. And at that point, there hadn't been a change in that rate for the previous 20 years. Um, literacy is a, is a is a big issue in Malawi and um, just 3% of women complete secondary education. So this is a huge issue for women. I'm then gonna focus in again on Mangochi. So Mangochi is a district in Malawi and it's um, just situated at the, the very kind of southern tip of Lake Malawi. Um, the local language here is Yao and the overall literacy rate for Mangochi for um, individuals age five and upwards is just 53%. So it's the lowest of all of Malawi's 32 districts. Um, and this is a problem for um, adults in Mangochi, but also for children. So many children never attend school, or if they do, they do so quite infrequently. So Yao is the local language in Mangochi. So just to be clear about this, because we're going to talk about Yao quite a lot. Yao is a language, but it's also um, a, a tribe, a group of people. So Yao women are doubly marginalized, first on account of their gender and secondly on account of their mother tongue, which is a minority language in Malawi. And minority language speakers often have no access to mother tongue literacy training. Oh, I was trying to move on, but then I realized <laughs> I can't. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> okay, so um, that's uh, Malawi and Yao. So enter literacy for women in Africa. So this is the program that the Finnish Bible Society run. Um, the scope and reach of the literacy for women in Africa program or LWA is um, quite impressive. So LWA aims to reduce illiteracy among women and promote lifelong learning opportunities. The programme originated in Malawi in 2015, but it's also now active in Ethiopia, in Kenya, Namibia and Tanzania. There's a couple of um, kind of foundational principles of, of LWA projects. Um, so all classes are taught in learners' mother tongue and they cover the basics of literacy. So they go over the alphabetic principle, so the idea that you can link sounds to symbols on the, on, on the page. Um, they teach grapheme, phoneme correspondences, so those specific language specific links. Uh, they teach phonological awareness, so that's um, awareness of and ability to manipulate the sounds of your language. Um, reading comprehension and basic writing skills. So as Cathy mentioned, um, the aims of this programme really address um, two of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, specifically to ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning, and to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the YOW project now. So. The YOW project is one part of the LWA programme. So as I said, it's now active in other countries um, in Africa, but we're specifically thinking about YOW within the Mangochi district. So the YOW project was established in Mangochi in 2017, um, and it's grown quite substantially since it was first initiated. A lot of what we're going to talk about um, today relates to data from the 2021 learners. So the group of learners who went through the programme from March to October in 2021. In that year, um, 70 villages accessed the YOW project, so across, across the district. In total, 1,306 learners completed the course in YOW, of whom 95% were female. Instruction for the, for the project, for the literacy course, is in YOW. Um, and Yao's interesting. So it's a very, very transparent orthography. orthography. So the, the links between graphemes and phonemes are consistent, unlike <laughs> in English. <laughs> so Yao's a Bantu language. Bantu is a family of languages that are um, uh, that you see all over southern Africa. 
and they're very rich in the use of prefixes and suffixes. So there's lots of morphology to kind of get a handle on. So we have very transparent orthography and lots of morphology. So it's really a lovely language um, to, um, to, to learn to read and write, I imagine. Um, <laughs> it's the first language of the Yao people, but it's a minority language in Malawi. So about 2 million people um, speak Yao in Malawi. So just to go into a little bit more of what we were asked to do. So the Finnish Bible Society in 2020 asked us to complete two evaluation reports. The first report was completed in the summer of 2021. This was a desk evaluation of the teaching materials and the Yao teacher guide. And the aim of that report was to compare course materials to known best practice in supporting adult learning. The second report was um, finished in autumn last year, and it was an evaluation based on a field trip that Cathy and I did um, in September. So the evaluation was based on um, observations made during that field trip and interviews um, made during that field trip, plus data that was collected about learner literacy skill. So the aim of that second report was to test out some hypotheses that we'd established in the first report, and to further evaluate elements of the project that couldn't be observed from those course materials. So the way that we've structured our evaluation of the Yao project was using COMB. So this is um, a model of behaviour change developed by Susan Mitchie at UCL um, in 2011. So COMBI is a really well-established interdisciplinary tool for designing and evaluating interventions for all sorts of behaviour change. It provides a systematic way of thinking through what's required to bring about a desired change in behaviour. And the idea is that that behaviour change can come about as a result of change in one of three components, capability, opportunity and motivation. So what we do here is to consider each of these components and how they contribute to change in the desired behaviour, where that behaviour is reading and writing and disadvantaged women in Africa. Our sources of evidence when um, approaching this evaluation were firstly um, a set of data about progress made by those 1,306 learners um, who uh, completed the course in 2021. So for those guys, we have um, data about literacy skill at baseline. So just before they started the course, which was in um, March or April 2021, um, their literacy skill at end line that October, and then follow up data from the following March, so from March 2022. We also have learner questionnaires at those same time points. So the questionnaires look at things like um, their background, so whether these women attended school as children, um, their motivations for attending the course, so why they have chosen to be there, and later whether they feel like they've um, made the changes that they wanted to make. We also have those materials from the LWA team um, that were used to, as the basis for the first report. We have our observations from the field. And then we have a lot of interviews that we that we did with stakeholders in the field as well. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about data collection because um, data collection is something that we've kind of talked about a lot with the team and it's something that we uh, were and are incredibly excited about. So we think that adult literacy programs um, could be an incredibly rich source of data. Um, and when we were first thinking about this project, the kinds of questions that we were wanting to answer were, okay, so what kind of change is possible within the adult brain learning this complex skill set of literacy? We wanted to look at reading speed and changes in comprehension over the course. We wanted to think about who attends adult literacy classes and why they do. So what difference does it make us to language of instruction or the language being taught or the native language of the learner? What about their educational level, their age, their gender? Um, we wanted to know what difference the learning environment could make. So what happens when you change course duration or course the frequency of classes? 
what happens when you um, have teachers who are trained to a different degree? What happens when you use different pedagogical approaches? And what about the influence of culture, of uh, community involvement and religion and gender roles? So we had a lot of questions coming into this and, uh, and grand ideas as to what the data could do. We still have those grand ideas, but um, Kathy, if you uh, flip onto the reality. Okay, the reality um, showed us that there were constraints here. So what happened with this data collection is that it was all gathered by teachers on the ground and they were very willing to complete that data collection and they were completely amazing about it. But doing that data collection took a considerable amount of time away from teaching, which obviously we don't want. Importantly, teachers were not trained in as any aspect of data collection. So fidelity was quite low and it was quite uncommon to have complete data sets for learners. Um, a particular difficulty that we experienced was that learners um, in Malawi use multiple names in different contexts. So quite often learners would fill in questionnaires with different names. So tracking them over multiple data collection points was very difficult. Um, we all know that data collection is a data entry is quite laborious and we found that it was particularly error prone here. We also found that it wasn't really possible to collect the pre and post intervention skill data that we would have ideally liked. So we have quite basic measures um, of, of literacy skill at each time point. Right, so I'm going to start thinking about the combi model a bit more, and I'm going to start by thinking about capability. The intervention component capability describes any changes that are brought about in knowledge or skill in the target group that enable progress towards the intervention goal. So we're thinking about knowledge and skill change. Capability is really the key intervention component of this project. And the way that it was addressed was through the provision of literacy classes. So when we're thinking about changes in capability, um, I guess we're being quite reductionist in a way. We're thinking about letter naming, about single word reading, about sentence reading and comprehension, paragraph comprehension and writing skills. And again, just to go over the data that we have about this, um, we have data from baseline, endline and follow up six months later. At baseline, learners were asked to name three letters, read a word and read a simple sentence. At endline, that assessment was repeated, but with three sentences, and then at follow up, the baseline assessment was repeated again. And this is essentially what we found. So because we saw quite a lot of, well, yes, a lot of data loss, um, we only have longitudinal um, data about baseline and endline from 100 learners. So this is the change that we saw in skill level between those two time points. So you can see along the X axis here, we've got reading level where zero is um, not able to name three letters. One is able to name three letters, but not able to read a word. Two is word level reading and three is sentence level reading. And you can see that the vast majority of learners um, at baseline, which is in gray, are not able to name three letters whereas the vast majority at end line are able to read at either a single word or sentence level. And we found that the majority of learners moved up two reading levels between baseline and end line. So for example, from not being able to name two letters to single word reading. So how does that relate to this um, literacy continuum? So as Cathy was saying, uh, literacy is not a binary state so we move through uh, from the very bottom of kind of basic literary literacy understanding through to functional literacy which is defined by unesco as the ability to read and write a short sentence about one's own life up to um, literacy for comprehension so that's where we see the emergence of fluent literacy so being able to read at about 90 to 100 words per minute Obviously, um, a, a program like this isn't aiming to achieve functional fluency, um, sorry, fluent literacy within six months. But what we do see 
is a really solid emergence of functional literacy for these learners. So they're learning the alphabetic principle, they're learning metalinguistic awareness, so that ability to play with the sounds of their language, they're learning phoneme grapheme correspondences, and they're developing that ability to decode. So we see this emergent literacy. We also had a bit of a, a bit of a dive into the into the data. So we looked at which learners do particularly well on this course. So we took those hundred learners for whom we have baseline and endline data, um, and we ran a model with the predictors um, age group, reading level at baseline, and the number of languages spoken as a kind of proxy for oral language skill. And what we found was that reading level at baseline was the only um, predictor of um, of change. So those who started with a lower reading level at baseline showed more change. So it could be that these guys just simply had further to go because they're starting at a lower level. Or it could be that the course is particularly effective for those learners who start with very basic literacy skills, which is as it was designed. We also had to think about the maintenance of skill at that follow up point. So five or six months after the end of the course, are learners still able to do what they were able to do at Endline? So we have data for 200 learners um, in this regard, and we found that yes, maintenance was actually really impressive. So the median change in reading level for this sample between those two time points was zero. And actually 35 learners increased their reading level between these two points. And that's kind of hinting at um, the, the dedication that learners put into um, advancing their, their learning and their literacy development after the course. Okay, so going back to that kind of um, original World Bank report and the idea of what is it that constrains learning in adulthood? So Cathy's going to talk about some of the kind of broader issues, but I'm just going to focus on the adult brain for a minute. So we know that adults learn differently from children, and it follows that understanding those changes should mean that we can optimally support um, learning in adulthood and the acquisition of literacy. So one of the most tricky things is that when you sit an adult down in a classroom, you're asking them to learn at a time when their brain is not expecting to learn. And this is the idea of sensitive periods. So a sensitive period is a window um, in the life of a juvenile animal when their brain is particularly susceptible to um, change as a result of changes from the environment. So at the end of that window of time, what we see is adaptive reductions in the extent to which the brain is changed by the environment. Crucially, though, sensitive periods or the sensitive periods that we know about are seen in fundamental low level sensory motor systems. And we can see that quite clearly when we look at second language acquisition and where the constraints are, they tend to be low level, they tend to be sensory and motor. For example, we see reduced sensitivity to sounds that are not typically in our, in our environment from under one year of age. Whereas when we look at grammatical structure, we don't see reduced sensitivity to novel structures until around 10 to 12 years of age. And in sharp comparison, if we look at the acquisition of novel vocabulary, we don't see any decline in capacity until individuals um, hit around 65, 70. And that's because it's adaptive to keep the declarative memory systems flexible throughout life. And it's those declarative memory systems that support novel vo uh, vocabulary acquisition. So how does this relate to literacy? Well, um, inevitably, part of the answer is that we don't know. A big part of the answer is that we don't know. Um, we do know that when adults learn to read, we see experience induced changes to neuro architecture, specifically in the visual word form area. So this is a functionally defined area of cortex um, uh, in the left fusiform gyrus. Um, and this is the area where we see changes when children learn to read as well. So the same thing is happening in adulthood. In this area, reading speed in adult learners is correlated with the strength of response to repeat to printed words. Um, however, what we don't know 
is the extent to which plasticity limitations in those low level systems, so in sensory motor systems, might constrain literacy acquisition in adults. So essentially, should we expect this complex skill, literacy, to act more like grammar or more like vocabulary? We do know some other things though, and we know that the LWA programme adheres quite well to the principles of learning in the adult brain. So we can, I'm just going to take you through a few examples of how, uh, what happens in, in, in the classroom, um, um, yeah, adheres quite well to, to our understanding of learning. So for example, um, learners are required to actively retrieve information in the literacy classes. So for example, they're asked to read out loud as a group before the teacher has read um, um, a sentence or a passage of text. So we know that active retrieval as distinct from passive learning, where passive learning um, information is provided by a teacher. We, we think that active retrieval potentiates new learning in adults because it forces adults to recreate the knowledge every time they retrieve it. Uh, and the idea is that there's, that also supports the integration of that new learning with existing knowledge. Another important thing is that new material is presented in each class, but then all of that, all of that material is reviewed every fifth class. Okay, so we have this repetition of the, the same material every kind of uh, two weeks. So adults are really good at learning within a given session. But if you look at learning between sessions, they do worse than children. So children show improvements between sessions, whereas adults tend not to or show decline between sessions. We know, though, that the optimal um, kind of schedule for learning in adulthood is what's known as a, an extended schedule, where we see repeated presentations of material um, over longer intervals over time. And that's kind of, um, uh, it's kind of evident in the, the structure of the LWA classes. Another thing is that within the group of learners in Malawi, we saw really extraordinary levels of motivation and engagement. And this is something that Kathy's going to come back to in a moment. So we don't really know much about the role of motivation and engagement in humans, but we do know that rats in adulthood show neurophysiological changes in response to stimuli that they're trained to attend to whereas juvenile rats show the same cortical level changes in response to passive learning. We can also think about the strengths that adults bring to the programme simply by virtue of being adults and how those strengths are used to compensate for these age-related differences that we see. The first of these is that adults have larger vocabularies than children. So having a larger vocabulary lets you guess words that you can only partially decode, meaning that your reading is more fluent and you're able to extract more meaning as you go. Adults also have stronger executive functions, so attentional control, ability to plan. Um, they are able to attend for longer and it means that we see reduced influences of environmental distractors. This also supports metalinguistic awareness. So again, the idea of being able to play with the sounds of your language, and that's a key part of the classes um, within the, the YAO project. And I'll hand back to, to Cathy to talk about the other aspects of the COMBI model. Thanks, Vic. So um, the O, as highlighted here, stands for the opportunity component. And really that refers mainly to the provision of physical and social opportunities to learn to read and write. So physical opportunities include things like making sure that learners have materials for practice, uh, whereas social opportunity is more about providing a supportive learning environment. Um, in our evaluation, we saw very high levels of commitment of local communities, including village chiefs and other influential community members. So they really valued the opportunity which had come to their village in many cases for the first time in their lives. Um, they valued this opportunity to learn to read and write. 
predominantly for, for women, there were also some men. In fact, in one village, the village chief himself was a part of the literacy classes. Um, and becoming literate was really seen as an end in itself. So something meaningful for individuals and for the communities that they were part of, and not just as a route to other opportunities. Um, so really the main things that we talked about here were to do with the physical materials that were available to learners. Um, obviously money is a huge constraint in, in these areas and villages are working with what they've got. So in many cases, classes would take place outside under a tree. Um, in some cases they took over local primary schools and in many cases they were like in these pictures where they're kind of like a, a makeshift shelter where learners gather for classes. Um, but as you can see here, often classrooms had blackboards, which were really too small. So if you imagine, so you're kind of looking left and right in this picture, if you imagine being, in fact, the, the chap at the very back of the class here on the right is the village chief who I mentioned. But you can imagine for him and for people who are at the back of the class, that board is very difficult to see in the, the level of detail that they need to, to to make out sort of letter differences and so on. Um, then there were other cases where blackboards were too low or they were unstable. So when learners were asked, as they often were, to come and write at the board, it was really difficult for, for them to do it. Um, and then occasionally we saw um, sort of ideal cases, like in the picture on the right, where which was in a, a primary school classroom. And here, not only are boards big and stable and easily seen, but you can have more than one learner writing at a time, which is really important, not just for them to have practice in, in actually forming the letters, but for the whole class in having the opportunity to see letters that are slightly differently configured. Because as we all know from writing, an A can be many different things and exposure to many of those different things is, is something that, that learners really benefit from. Um, the other thing that nearly all learners and teachers that we interviewed talked about was their need for more materials to practice with. So they all are given uh, the literacy primer and these um, pictures here are, are sort of like pages taken from that primer. And that really is, you know, the, the scene as sort of, you know, the, the absolute kind of like canonical um, reference for them. But they really wanted to have more story booklets, health pamphlets, leaflets, stories they could read with their children so that they could practice beyond that because over the course of the um, program they become so familiar with the examples in the book that al almost it becomes automatic whereas exposure again to, to new materials not just for interest but to sort of like make sure that they're engaging all the processes that we hope they are um, there's a great need for new materials and that's when it becomes very difficult when learning is in a, a minority language because because there simply don't exist many materials in the Yao language. So creating new materials, which is something that the team is currently involved with doing, is a really costly and time consuming exercise. It involves local language experts, it involves gender consultants, religious consultants and all sorts of people. So it's a, it's a, it has huge cost implications. Um, then the, the third part of the combi is to do with uh, motivation. So here we're really interested in whether classes and learning is meaningful, engaging, relevant and active for learners. And from our previous paper evaluation, so the 2021 work that Vic's described, we thought that this might be a key area to work on. And because we'd observed that a large number of women dropped out of classes before they were complete. And so that kind of flagged to us that maybe motivation was was a problem. Um, so we came with that expectation. But actually what we met on the ground when we got there was a different story. I hope the sound is going to work on this.
And this wasn't just about having a welcome song, although that is a very important cultural um, habit of all the communities that we met with. But this spontaneous singing also turned out to be a feature of every single class that we visited. So songs filled the gaps in classes while teachers were busy writing something on the board or where there was just a kind of to give a bit of a boost of energy when when things were flagging a bit or if someone had succeeded with a piece of learning then songs would kind of erupt out of you couldn't often tell where they started but then everybody would join in um so there's another example of, um oh sorry uh, which is from a from a classroom setting so the singing represented a kind of communal way to regulate the attention and emotions of the class and it really contributed to a very strong sense that learning was a collective endeavor more than an individual one um, so in terms of other surprises, so motivation was a very big one and linked to that, um, we'd expected that the high number of women who dropped out of classes might be a sign of problem with engagement. So we interviewed a group of women who had dropped out of classes the previous year to sort of understand what had happened and whether it was to do with the, you know, what, what were the issues that made them stop? Was it to do with the frequency of classes or the content or that sort of thing? And what we were told was actually that the reasons for stopping in almost all cases were major life events often involving deaths or serious illness of family members. And what that meant was that the women had to then use every hour they had to either care for that person if it was serious illness or to work to replace lost income if it was their husband who died. Um, and they were really sorry to have had to stop and they all remained highly motivated and talked about how desperately they wanted to to start learning again if you know if if they became able to do so um another big surprise was the teachers um and this picture on the slide here are two of all the classes have two teachers and they sort of like swap between them over the course of uh, the two hour lesson as a way of sort of giving a bit of variety and changing the pace um the the woman on the left is actually also the village chief of of the village um where this lesson was so the teachers what we knew before we went were none were qualified teachers many hadn't completed uh, full education themselves as children they were selected from a very limited pool in local villages and they received just two weeks of training so on that basis we expected that teaching quality might have been uh, a constraint to uh, the effectiveness of classes but Again, we felt we were wrong. Um, in practice, it seemed that the advantages of teachers being native Yao speakers, of them being known and respected members of the local community and being locally available for classes and for sometimes practice outside classes or drop-ins to find out why somebody hadn't shown up on a particular day. All of those qualities outweighed the potential disadvantage of them not having a kind of greater educational qualification. And in fact, the high quality of teaching was something that we were really struck by and, and, and commented on. Um, religion was an issue, I mean, this might have been in some of your minds since we mentioned the connection with the Finnish Bible Society, and it was certainly in ours, um, you know, in terms of sort of having a certain set of questions and cautiousness around what the motivations might be. I suppose, you know, crudely, we were thinking, how could it be that a Christian organisation set up to sell Bibles could be fully committed to a program which was teaching almost exclusively Muslim women to read and write in their native language. And the answer, it seemed, lay in the huge 
genuine commitment of the program um, administrators on the ground to women's empowerment, um, which in turn meant that they had made incredible efforts to make learning culturally and religiously appropriate and to work with village chiefs to help them to understand that their motives were pure, to make sure that booklets didn't contain any religious reference and that there was no sense that there was some other agenda. Um, so what are our lessons for educational neuroscience? Um, well, even, I, I, I always slightly hesitate saying the words educational neuroscience because neuroscience happens in brains but brains only happen in people who only happen in a community, which only happens in a culture and a history. And translating neuroscience findings to real learning is about much more than the narrow problem, which we talk about a lot, which is how do you get pure lab study findings to work in a classroom? And it's much more about how, how do we align what we know about how brains work best with what we understand about the social, emotional, dynamic, culturally specific education that we're hoping to improve. And our experience really made us think that without that kind of interdisciplinary thinking, we don't have a great chance of making teaching and learning really effective. Um, so that's us. I think I can't see a clock or anybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for listening. But I, I'm hoping we have time for some questions if people have them. So that was uh, perfectly timed. Many thanks to both of you. That's a fantastic overview and presentation. Uh, so yeah, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if people either want to put them in the uh, in the chat and I can read them out uh, or uh, you can uh, raise your hand, uh, turn on your camera and microphone and, and ask yourself. So uh, I've got a couple of hands up. Let's see if I can see uh, where they are. So uh, Chloe, you want to jump in first and then Astrid? Yeah, first of all, Kathy and Vic, thank you for a really, really inspiring and beautifully delivered talk. Really, really interesting. Louise and I were having a little private conversation about how amazingly helpful we thought the Montessori materials might be in this instance. So, for example, one of what I think is one of the most amazing pieces of Montessori material for the literacy curriculum is a small movable alphabet, which is sets of cut out letters that people can move around to make words and things like that. So that's just an aside, um, nothing to do really with anything else, but I just thought the Montessori materials would be very useful in this context. Yeah, they sound amazing. So they're, they're, are they easy to make? Um, like they're made, what, what are they made from? You can make them yourself, but Louise will probably be able to give more details about the practicalities. But yes, I mean, I've made them myself. They're time consuming to do, yes. but you can. You, you can also buy them probably at quite a big cost, but they should be makeable locally. But as I say, Louise will probably be able to give more detail. Yeah, actually, we are uh, training and have been for many, many years training teachers in um, Kenya, Tanzania and um and just about started in Ethiopia. And the way that we train them actually is not to provide them with Montessori materials, but part of the training is that they create their own Montessori materials. Because our whole idea behind the, it's called the Help the Child Project, was not to go in with our kind of, you know, um, rich, you know, highly costing materials, but to, to go in and get, help them to help themselves so that when we leave, they can make their own things. So all of the teachers on our courses there go away at the end of the course with two bags that they can, um, which are a school in a bag or a school in two bags actually. And they can go out into the, you know, into the hinterland and deliver their uh, Montessori um, activities um, anywhere really and they can be uh, totally self-sufficient. Um, we've just also been a project with the Samburu tribe and um, so there's for me a lot of resonance with this Kathy because um, I see you know 
some of the work that we are doing has you know a lot of connections with this work super thanks astrid do you want to ask your question yeah thank you oh i so enjoyed that talk and thank you so much for you know really clearly talking us through your your process really really enjoyed it very valuable um yeah i was i was just sitting here thinking that it must have been quite challenging evaluating those teaching materials um you know for teaching a language that you know you yourselves don't don't speak I'm, I'm assuming you're not very familiar with the language i just i just thought maybe you could tell us a bit more about um what that experience was like I think you're off mute, so I'm taking that as you <clears throat> wanting to jump in. <laughs> I was off mute anyway. Um, um, yeah. Evaluating that material, yeah. Um, I mean, um, I mean that 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 I suppose the the great thing about the materials that these guys have produced is that they are designed to ensure really high fidelity of class structure. Um, across the across the six months so um i think that came about as a sort of necessity because they were so dedicated to this idea of training local teachers so that community buy-in and engagement was as high as possible and because of that they weren't able to rely on um kind of um in on a lot of teacher training or skill right from the start so the materials are very, very um, structured uh, and very clear and work through a specific course from start to end. So actually, when looking at them, we were looking at a session plan and a set of materials for clarity. Um, and the session plans um, kind of walk through some of these foundational skills that you need for early literacy development. So in every lesson there's a little bit of metalinguistic awareness in every lesson there's there's um, understanding grapheme phoneme correspondences in every lesson there's a little bit of work on comprehension so actually for us it was just like a matter of <laughs> like ticking off a checklist it's uh, it, that that bit was quite easy actually it was it was just so beautifully structured yeah <laughs> I'd just add to that that actually yeah. one thing because we're at the time when we were visiting classes they'd been running for quite a, many yeah. weeks already such that some of the classes had reached the end of the booklets and were going back to do revision classes and it was quite interesting seeing that because that's where you saw I think as Vic said that there it was hugely beneficial in making sure that all learners achieved a certain level that the book that the course was incredibly tightly structured but what it meant for learners once they'd reached that level mm -hmm. and for teachers who'd been taught to that book mm -hmm. that actually what was difficult for them was kind of going a bit more off piste and having yeah. the flexibility to think hey, I can throw in some different examples here, or I can get people to sort of come up with their own ideas. And that was something that we talked a lot with the team about afterwards is not is like that what happens next with these women who finish this course, they're still incredibly motivated to want to learn more and to continue to improve and to get better. Um, but the teacher the teachers aren't necessarily equipped. I mean, we felt from seeing how they taught that they were equipped, but they themselves didn't feel that they were kind of materially equipped to know how to sort of progress beyond that. So I think that, you know, there's definite kind of pros of doing a, a highly structured um, set of material, teaching materials, but there's also like maybe a bit further on, there's also a little bit of a downside. Great, thanks. I'll I'll take a question from the the chat bar. Uh, Ganessa Morthy asks, "Hello, Kathy and Victoria. Whilst I'd agree that capability and opportunity can be subjected to evidence-based, quantitative-driven data, traditionally motivational measures tended to be subjective. How then were you able to collect quantitative, evidence-based data? Were you able to measure motivation via wearable devices or brain imaging devices?" I mean, that would be fascinating. Um, no, we weren't able to. So, um, uh, yeah, our our quantitative data collection was was limited to um, uh, so literacy skill development 
uh, and also a little bit of sort of demographic and, and, and motivation data in terms of why learners had come to classes in the first place. But, but most of the, the data that, that we have about motivation, as you say, is, is very subjective. But I think that the, the videos that Kathy showed do speak volumes. And we saw that level of motivation and engagement really consistently across all the classes that we saw. Great, thanks. Uh, um, any more questions? Otherwise, I'm going to be naughty and jump in with one of my own. So um, I'm interested at the outset when, when we were looking at the literature on this, we, we were identifying the importance of what literacy meant to the individuals in their lives as, as a motivating factor. And, and I'm wondering what you found out about that, and particularly that the, the tension of uh the learning in the mother tongue yeah uh it's easier because they know the phonology and it's their first language but then it might be more useful for them in employment to um have the the national language which is a uh, uh, chichiwa but then they're not going to learn it as well right but it might be more useful to them so how, how did that play out um, on the ground Kathy, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, lots to say on both of those yeah. questions. I, think, <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of, so the, I think the, the first part of your question about like what literacy meant to learners, I think we felt after the event that we had come with a lot of quite Western assumptions about what makes people want to learn to read and write. And that those things are really about me as an individual and my life goals. And actually what we found from being there was what was far more important was we all get to a certain level than I get stretched to my maximum capability. Um, and people were really talked about that. Like they, if there was someone who was struggling in a class, people would not hesitate to say, let's go back and pick that person up with whatever additional kind of repeated practice we need so that we can bring everybody along with us. And actually, it slightly sends shivers up my spine when I talk about it, because it's just such a different way of thinking about teaching and learning. So I think that we slightly, you know, even though we had done those forms, asking people, why do you want to learn to read? Um, is it so that you can read the signs on, you know, the bus stop? Or is it to kind of practice with your children? When we asked women why they wanted to learn to read and write, they said, because there's an opportunity to learn to read and write, you know, which they'd never had before. And that in itself, and the thing about the thumb, like the thing about the thumb was absolutely massive. Um, but I think, so I think that was where they started from. But then I think by the time that they got further along in the course, there were many questions that they were starting to ask about what language might be most useful to them if they were to continue to improve. And the subject of actually, will there be classes to kind of transition to Chichewa, which is a quite similar language. It wouldn't be a very difficult um, transition in terms of, you know, recognizing the letters of the words and things, but the level of fluency of many of the learners is much less in Chichewa. Like they have function, you know, good functional Chichewa, but they don't have it. It's not kind of like, it's not a mother tongue like Yao, but there was a lot of discussion. And I think it's a real dilemma for the program, um, especially as they're thinking about longer term sustainability and development and what happens after, you know, these literacy classes go into a village for a year kind of hoover up everyone who wants to learn and then they move on to the next village so it's not like there's lots of opportunities to keep learning and developing in different languages but I, it's something that they're really thinking about is how to how to give opportunities in in languages that might be kind of um jumping off points for better work opportunities and, and other things like that Great. Do we have any other questions from anyone? If not, we are at. I have one. Sorry, very yeah, quick one. It's maybe slightly, slightly off topic, but it's more that I'm not. I'm not kind of super knowledgeable in that field. But related to that point, does it has it been shown that you, um, you're faster at learning a language you can speak well, learning to read a language you can speak well, and then you can transfer it more easily to another language? Is that is that shown as to be a route that kind of works better? Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, um, I, don't, I don't know that that's been shown as such, um, but certainly um, like a, a key part of, of these literacy classes is um, comprehension and the, the level of um, oral skill in Chichewa um, was just so variable a, across women in the classes that I, that I don't think that everybody could get to that same level of comprehension. It could, I mean, it's not a criticism. I'm just wondering whether actually it's a good, you know, it's a good path to go through yeah. your own language to learn and to read, and then you can transfer it more quickly to something else that you may be a bit less fluent in. Yeah, I mean, maybe it depends on um, how how different the the grapheme phoneme correspondences are. So I think the difference between Yao and Chichewa in terms of that correspondence is just one change. So, like in Yao, they they don't have a um, they don't have the sound ch actually. <laughs> Whereas in Chichewa, that's a single letter. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, other, the other thing, sorry, very last thing, no, um, no. is that actually, I think that, I mean, this isn't an evidence-based answer, but I think that what a lot of what is happening with women who've never learned to read and write is that when they're coming to these classes, they're also learning how to learn mm. and that feels like that is transferable even if some of the details of which language to which you know I think that there would be a lot of complexity in there but it seems like you know they all talked about how fantastically difficult it was for the first few weeks they were like my brain just can't do this um but then they did after the first sort of like month of classes realized actually I can and by working together you know we can do it so I think that feels certainly you wouldn't be starting from the baseline if you were to then move on to another language in that respect yeah super so at that point I want to thank again Kathy and Vic for a fantastic uh talk and uh thanks for everyone for attending uh and uh we'll wrap up the session there thanks very much everyone. thanks Michael thank you guys thanks, everyone <laughs> bye